sheets. Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the Dutch Postcard Lottery. My name is Dorina Manson. I'm uh, the managing director, the director of the lottery. We are extremely proud to be able to offer our auditorium this afternoon to Free Press Unlimited, one of our partners. The Dutch Postcode Lottery supports, provides long-term core funding to over 140 civil society organizations worldwide. Organizations that strive for a green and just world. One of the important topics being human rights and free press. Free Press Unlimited has been one of our partners since 1997 that we support with annual unearmarked funding and extra donations. This year, for example, we granted an extra 500,000 euro for the program A Safer World for the Truth that works on the pursuit of justice for crimes committed against journalists, a subject that is very applicable to the current situation in Ukraine. It is said that this is the first war that is not only fought on the physical battleground, but it is also a war of information. So, your work is more important than ever, I would say. This afternoon, you will learn from journalists in and around Ukraine about the support that is needed now. I wish you an informative and inspiring session. Thank you. Donc voilà, là il y a deux corps. Deux corps. Je sais qu'en France on n'a pas envie de voir les blessés. Moi je vous les montre. Je suis désolée. La guerre c'est ça. La guerre c'est ça. Uh, yes, Poland is letting in Ukrainian refugees, and you know here on the ground near the border, we've seen a wave of solidarity. Uh, people are welcoming them with food, or with drinks, with information centers. Завда на руйнації житловому будинку люди просять про допомогу. Рятувальники зараз на місці. Ми працюємо, обстежуємо кожну оселю, виводимо людей. Putin's children are in Netherlands. In Germany, in mansions, where are all these mansions seized? I don't see that. This is definitely a scary moment. Uh, it's kind of unbelievable now that we were out to dinner last night in Kyiv. I was watching people walk into the opera house and a lot of Ukrainians I talked to said, we're just gonna go about our days as normal. We can't live with the fear constantly. It's about seven o'clock in the morning. We're here in the streets of Kiev. You can probably hear behind me all over the city, there are bomb sirens going off. This morning, a couple hours ago, Russia began its war on Ukraine. Je ne prends pas de position, simplement. Ce que vous dites est factuel. Il faut quoi? Ce que vous dites est factuel. Et, et ces populations aujourd'hui. population. Thank you, Doreen, for your very kind words and the long-standing long support of the Dutch Postcard Lottery. It's very, very much appreciated. Thank you all for being here, for showing your support, for showing solidarity with journalists and the media reporting on the Ukraine. This crisis event, the goal of this crisis event, is to gather and to materialize all kind of support to set up a media lifeline in Ukraine. That's why we brought experts in the field together here. That's why we want to join with you to maintain a free flow of information, reliable information, in war times. We've been working with our Ukraine partners now for years. We've been uh, preparing together with them the last weeks for an invasion in the north. But, as you all know, we were completely surprised, we were, by the invasion of the whole country. 
So we needed to rethink and shift our minds. And that's why we came up just a couple of days ago to set up this media lifeline. So apologies up front if this event is not going as smooth as it might uh, be or can be. All the resources of independent media in Ukraine are thrown to provide reli reliable, real-time information about the country's resistance to the Russian invasion. They increasingly ask for support in production, equipment, safety. And if this is not supported in time, they cannot efficiently fight the disinformation that is going on. So, this situation begs for a creative and flexible ideas on how to maintain and setting up this media lifeline, Ukraine. Free Press Unlimited is already providing emergency support. We do that together with many other organizations. We try to coordinate as much as possible. Just yesterday, we shipped around 50 life vests to the border of Poland. Um, we issued over a couple of dozen VPN codes. We have a strong network in the region because we are already present in the region for decades, supporting independent media over there. But now we need newer, stronger, more effective and creative ideas to help our friends over there, our colleagues, to keep the media lifeline alive. We love to hear your thoughts and your ideas on this. <coughs> and we will give you time to speak up. But first, we want to hear what journalists on the ground are saying, what is going on, media experts on the current developments and needs. We hope by the end of this meeting that you will join us in a pledge for support for this media lifeline. Um, afterwards, uh, our colleagues are standing by where you can actually um, testify your uh, pledge by writing down, writing down your name, email. We need any kind of support. This is not about Free Press Unlimited. This is about setting up the media lifeline for Ukraine and the larger region. So let's do it. Let's start. And we start with the Ukrainian journalist Maxim Irsadi. Maxim, a very, very warm welcome. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, my apologies in advance because I usually am a much better speaker than today. Um, it's been a week, but you know, all my insights are still trembling, uh, seeing every day what is done to my country, to places I was born, to people that are still there, to my family, to my home city, uh, the level of decimation, devastation, uh, uh, genocide that is done to my people is, of course, it's uh, something that is uh, highly unsettling even for a person who is not there at the moment. Um, but I'm here uh, to talk about my colleagues and my friends in Ukraine. Um, Ukraine has uh, tens of thousands of journalists who are still there. This is a massive country. And a lot of journalists, the majority of journalists are still there, from the occupied Kherson, from decimated Kharkiv to the sieged Kiev. They're still working there 24 7, bringing the story alive. Because this is, their, uh, this is something they have to do as Ukrainians, but also because they understand that this is the most important story for Europe in the, since the World War II. And, uh, you know, we hear a lot of, you know, stories about how brave they are, and they are, and uh, how they all pull together and work at the moment, because, for example, there, is, uh, there are no individual newsrooms anymore. You know, Ukraine has 
doesn't have, has, has had dozens of newsrooms before. Now they all work together 24-7 in one war newsroom trying to pull resources as much as possible. And uh, their work is outstanding and there are a lot of coverage, you know, um, that basically focuses on how brave Ukrainians are and how, you know, many people are surprised that they withstand uh, such a big pressure for so long time. But there is also a story that I hear every day that they don't tell in their reporting. Um, the story of struggle, of the same uh, psychological pressure that people have, because Ukrainian reporters are not war reporters, and what they're seeing, what has been done to their houses and their cities, this is extremely traumatic for everyone. I know, you know, slightly because during 2014 revolution, when I saw first time death and, you know, violence and my city being uh, turned into urban warfare, I had a very traumatic PTSD after that. And that's why probably part of the reason why I'm here and not there, because I'm not brave enough to face it once again. But all those people who are there, they make this choice every day. But th this is not something they will tell you. They, don't, they won't tell you the difficult choices they have to make. To stay, report, or send your kids and your family somewhere to evacuate, and you don't know if you're going to see them. There's something that they tell me on the phone every day that they stopped recognizing their cities and what is happening when they go on the field and report after bombardments, after uh, the violence done to the cities, that sometimes they don't recognize the blocks anymore and the places they loved. Um, the issues that affect them on an everyday basis, you know, lack of medicine, some people started especially with chronic diseases, process of withdrawal because there's not enough medicine. And all these stories that you don't see are important for you to know because unlike the narrative that it's out there, this, you know, that uh, Devi versus Goliath kind of struggle, Ukrainian people versus Russian invaders, it's very nice and inspiring both for Ukrainians and for the world. But also, I feel it, there's danger that creates a bit of false sense of accomplishment on our side, that we've done enough. And unfortunately, the math is against them and against Ukrainian people. The army that Ukraine faces is much stronger than Ukrainian has resources. And they can withstand and they will stay there and they will work and they will do their duty as journalists and as Ukrainians for as long as they can. But if there is no support, it, it won't take long before those people uh, start bleeding and you know people starting killed and uh, the situation will get much worse. Much worse. What do you think that journalism needs in order to survive uh, in this crisis and to continue their work? Well, I think that this is, I don't want to sound like this is like a charity that, that we come here to donate because we have spare resources. I think one thing that I want to communicate first and foremost, that this is our obligation because this is what Europeans do in times of crisis. This is what we've done during the uh, World War II, you know, having each other's back. And this is what European journalists in Ukraine want us to have to do to show this solidarity. In terms of resources, this is very basically simple. Imagine a country that is in the in a war, the supply chains collapse, so you don't have you know batteries, you don't have vests. Again, you know, tens of thousands of journalists who are not war reporters, they need vests, they need protective gear, they need really basic things to stand and report and uh, survive on the reporting field. Mm -hmm. But do you think that there is a need for a media lifeline in Ukraine? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be here if I... <laughs> <laughs> but I think, look, I want to emphasize it very strongly. What we're seeing now is moving away from initial shock and initial, you know, breaking news uh, emergency 
to something that looks more and more like marathon. It doesn't matter if the war might end in two weeks or three weeks, the devastation that the country is already having, the millions of refugees, this will take years and years and years of really grueling work on behalf of Ukrainian journalists. Okay, yeah. And the, the story that they try to tell, especially during the conflict, is extremely important how they tell it now. Because the way the stories are told will affect the post-conflict uh, terrain as well. Why do you think uh, we were so, you know, unbothered by the war in Ukraine that has been happening for eight years before? This is not something that happened just a week ago. Ukraine has been living in the shadow war for eight years. Why? Because Ukrainian journalists did a tremendous job of covering the conflict in the right way and not to provoke more polarization, not to provoke more hatred and try to build bridges between you know, the uh, communities that were affected by war and try to uh, uh, drive the temperature down. Now imagine just 7% of the territory that was affected. Now this is much bigger. So the resources that they need are also much bigger for that. Thank you so much, uh, Maxime. We'll get back to you later. Um, we tried to uh, contact yesterday a colleague of you, Angelina Kajukina, news director of uh, Ukraine uh, Public Broadcaster. But at the moment that we were going to have a live connection, she, the airstrike started and she had to shelter again. So. But we have with us Natalia Humenyuk of the Public Interest Journalist Lab. Natalia. Hi. 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 How? Yeah, very good to see you. How are you and where are you? Uh, can I not really say that? No. Okay, that is very good to hear. Can you describe the situation on the ground? So really, if you speak about the journalists, uh, let me explain you know, the most important things uh, to understand. That, of course, the uh, the risks are everywhere. The key places are the places where the fighting is taking place. This is Kiev, Kharkiv, but also the cities in the east. Something to understand for the you know people who want to work and understand how to help the Ukrainian journalists is uh, that the possible attacks are more or less everywhere. Yeah, of course, the risk of alone the Russia and Belarus, which is 2,000 kilometers, and in the south, and in the east, but also Kiev and major towns. And these are big towns. You know, Kharkiv is a million people, Kiev is four million people. And uh, the journalists need to be everywhere because the most vulnerable are, especially those, for instance, towns around these big cities which are shelled. So, for instance, if we speak about today, in the moment like today, what is the most important for people, for instance, like the, the number one job for people? You in Kharkiv, a couple of towns around Kharkiv are shelled, and you need to go there. If you are in Kiev, you need to get out of your office and go, for instance, to this town, one, two, three, four. This is distance. So the journalists are needed everywhere you cannot leave. Most of the news from Ukraine, they relocated earlier. Mm -hmm. The journalists to the uh, you know a lot of Western Western Ukraine, so a lot of people are working with their laptops, and they are doing a great job. And this new source really needs support, financial. You know, I should also say that hotels are full. It's even basically to pay for a relocation of all those people and make them work at the moment when each of those people, all the persons, should take care of their families. But at the same time, in the bigger towns, especially which are currently under assault, and we're speaking about dozen towns, including the big ones, uh, this is their, you know, just, I won't say like the bravers, but the people who are able to work in these circumstances remain, or those who cannot go due to some family or any other reasons. Uh, so the resources are very limited. There are very few people who are it's, not very few, it's very much not enough people who should stay. So for instance, give an example. There were a lot of independent news in the eastern region of Ukraine and Donbass supported by donors and you know what, we understand, they were right. there. 
but because they were the first to be you know attacked and they were the first to be in case targeted by Russia, they were the first to relocate. Just yeah, really because right. for them it's critically dangerous. So we let in the people in Kharkiv, in Mariupol, in all the towns. In Kiev, uh, it's hard to work. Uh, for instance, like the public broadcaster, you talk about my close friend and colleague with whom we spent the last days in Geneva. She is running the news, but she's there with a couple of people more, and including my colleague from public interest journalist left, because there are just not very much people on the ground. And he, you really need resources. These are the big towns. Uh, there is a curfew. Uh, from you know, so you have a limited time during the daytime you can <coughs> travel. Mm -hmm. You need to have credential, but that's okay. Uh, you get them; it's easy. Uh, but you have the limited daytime to travel and to fail because everything takes time. There is no public transportation, so logistics is the number one complexity. Uh, because you need to have the bulletproof vest, you need to have the gear, you need to have a transport driver, not everybody drives fuel to get out mm. uh, and be ready. Right. Right? So, so this right. is maybe, it's, and this is so critical because there could be anybody else who would go to the towns and to, you know, film those destroyed buildings or would understand what actually needs to the people, because sometimes people are stuck there, they don't have, I don't know, water supply, or water supply, like very, very basic. So that's, uh, that's how would you, I describe what are the, 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 the risks of this situation. There mm -hmm. are not really many people who are working on the ground, to be honest, because despite everything, uh, you know, those journalists who were let's say, like, were maybe embedded with the army for the last years and have this security training and blah, blah, blah. Uh, quite a lot of them, especially male, they joined, return, they joined the army, they, they wanted to fight. Mm -hmm. um, so those people who are well trained, let's say, like myself, you know, there are not so many. And the, those who are remaining there, these brave, you know, younger youngsters, but he cautious about that because they are not really much trained to work in these circumstances. Mm -hmm. Uh, and again, especially Ukrainian reporters, compared to foreign reporters, they do not have the full, full, full infrastructure around them. Car, fuel, driver, security gear, all the things, and better not to go with that outside. Right. Natalia, this is very urgent, of course, and uh, we fully understand do you also see other needs for the mid-longer term? No, just like explaining, uh, I would say to speak more about practicality still. You know, everything I said is still very much shortage. What we understand that very soon in Kiev or in Kharkiv might be the situation that there won't be electricity, for instance, or there won't be, you know, um, internet for that. So these kind yeah. of ideas about the. Uh, all kind of the, the, the things like uh, the batteries, the, right. the place of generators, satellite phones, nobody can afford them and it should be considered to the most. It's not yet there, it's not that urgent, but it will come and then right. it will be too late unless we think about them. We need to That's prepare for that. Yeah. Even like the place to stay for many, just really the place. So for instance, I was based in the, uh, you know, the area in the city which was blocked because the bridges were blocked. So I needed to move out to a different place. So I needed to find a place, another place to stay. It was easy. So I moved out from my flat myself. Although I didn't feel like I was a kid. And a lot of people, for instance, who used to live, let's say, you know, they live in the suburb. Uh, and they were using public transport to drive, that was impossible. You need to kind of keep them together. You really need to keep these people together. And <coughs> they need to pay for prison and hotels are closed. So this is very critical. And this situation could happen later in Odessa, for instance, or right. any yeah. other town. Right. In the long run, uh, we understand about the, these offshore newsrooms. You know, the people who would work not from the places, but from outside. Uh, I'm talking to quite many, uh, you know, people would be exhausted. Uh, they need 
any kind of like any kind of financial support just to maintain them. There will be some people moving abroad, of course. Uh, there should be some so there should be some support for the which the journalists should rely. Sorry, so if you're just for the support. Just, just mm -hmm. to explain, usually the, the journalists are in, let's say like their twenties, thirties, forties. They are more capable. They have parents who are totally lost how to go grow or something. So actually this week for a lot of people the problem was they need to care about their families as well because they are the ones who are like more open to understand how to relocate the families. It's rare that they would have the something else in the family, like in my family that would be myself. I know every every journalist I know, it's exactly that person who need to work is the one in charge of organizing everything. Which is really like very difficult thing and takes a lot of time and you know takes your time in order to work. Okay. Which is understandable. Thank you. One thing I should say about the <laughs> two other things. Natalia, I need to cut you off because uh, we have so many other speakers as well. But I think it's clear and we will get get in touch with you later on. I, I just want to say probably you would have a difference whom I want to speak about is not the Ukrainian journalists any longer, but the Russians and the Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. You would probably we agree. have that. There were many of them in Ukraine. Yes. And we now know. they we are died, there were many of them in Ukraine. And now yeah. they are totally lost again. So we <laughs> don't really need to but that could be done just in the It's on our radar, so thank you for pointing it out. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you. So we just heard about the situation in Ukraine. I think thank you very much for uh, pointing on and this out. Uh, but what about the country of the aggressor, Russia? So let's have a look at a short, this time real short video by uh, the very great journalist and Nobel Prize winner, Dmitry Murantov. Мы сегодня рано все собрались в редакции. У нас горе. Наша страна по приказу президента Путина начала войну с Украиной. И некому остановить войну. Поэтому вместе с горем мы испытываем стыд. В руках главнокомандующий крутит, как брелок от дорогой машины, ядерную кнопку. Что, следующее, шаг ядерный залп? А как иначе истолковать слова Путина об оружии возмездия? Но этот номер новой газеты мы выпустим на двух языках, потому что мы никогда не признаем Украину врагом, а украинский язык языком врага. И последнее. Только антивоенное движение россиян, по-моему, может спасти жизнь на этой планете. Russian-speaking people don't know what is really going on. They are fed with disinformation and propaganda from all sides. With these immensely repressive measures, it's only a precursor of what is going to happen in neighboring countries. Russians themselves are totally deprived from independent fact-based news. They don't know what to believe anymore. Footage by social media, for instance, is debunked by the Russian government. So yesterday I had uh, a small conversation with uh, Derek Sauer, media entrepreneur, Dutch media entrepreneur, entrepreneur, who is now in Moscow. Let's have a look. So the situation for uh, Russian journalists is becoming dire with the hour, I would say. Uh, can you please give us an update what the status is at the moment and how are you and your staff? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so, uh, you know, you, as you say, it's more dire by the hour, I would almost say by the minute. Um, as you know, I mean, in the last couple of months, uh, many media were already closed or chased out of the country. Almost nothing uh, remains here. There is, there, we still have Novia Gazeta, uh, which still is open. 
and we have the Moscow Times uh, in English and our Russian surface, which is growing incredibly fast now, of course, in these days. Um, but it's becoming more and more dangerous by the hour. First of all, there was the order that we cannot use the, war, the words war or invasion. Uh, we have to talk about this special operation, but so far we refuse to do that because you know, we are journalists. But now the last thing, and that is really the last straw for all the independent journalists is that they are introducing a new law, uh, which in, uh, means that you will get, you risk to get 15 years of prison if you uh, 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 publish what they call fake news. And it's uh, of course up to them to decide what fake what news What is fake news is, and fake news is in this case, the truth. The few independent journalists left here uh, all want to leave because it it's becomes untenable. It becomes impossible to keep operating. Uh, I had calls this morning with many colleagues of mine um, and everyone now is planning uh, how they how we can get our Russian teams uh, out of the country um, and have them continue in other places right. um, because I mean it's more imperative than ever that uh, Russian language news independent news continues I mean it's already it's you know hard to explain for people who don't live here how uh, uh, awful the impact of the propaganda is. There is non-stop uh, propaganda on Russian television that that puts the story completely upside down. Unfortunately, if you watch this day in day out, year in year out, it has an impact. I'm afraid that uh, in the in the coming days when this law takes force next week probably so quick um, yeah 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 this 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 is a law if 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 putin signs it next week it might be the fastest uh, uh past law in in recent history you know that we are here today together and 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 find expertise on how to continue the media life life um, not only for the Ukrainians, but also for the Russians. This is vital for the region. But there is still a civil society. Uh, there are still a lot of uh, Russians that are embarrassed, uh, that are, you know, I have all these, my Russian friends crying, you know, in my office, you know, I mean, how can we do this to, to our brothers in Ukraine? Right. And millions and millions of Russians uh, who feel terrible about that. Um, and, you know, they have the right to be informed first. Uh, they have the right to be supported. Uh, and we should uh, uh, not make the mistake uh, to punish Putin, but to also punish all the Russians. Thank you, Derek. Keep up the okay. spirit. Bye-bye. Thank you. I think it's safe uh, to say that the situation with the Russian journalists is taking a turn for the worse. Hubert, you're a Russian expert, journalist, and co-founder of the Knowledge Platform Around the Prisons. What is your first reaction? Well, first, of all, uh, first of all, I would like to say something only on behalf of myself. We have talked the last eight years too much about Russia and not enough about Ukraine and Belarus. And that's a pity not only, but it's also a problem for Dutch journalists. We are focused on Russia and we are, we are forgetting about Ukraine and Belarus. <clears throat> uh, but, okay, Dan's quite clear in his remarks full scale dictatorship is upcoming in Russia. But still, Ukraine is the front line of democracy in Europe and not Russia. Uh, so, I don't know <laughs> to say more about the remarks of Dan Sauer. But still, we have to understand that the few independent journalists who are still working in Russia need our support. Because otherwise, Russian imperialism will win. Will win. But this is not only a military war, this is also an information war, right? 
what kind of information weapons can we actually use against it to fight this? Oh, I think we have to start to think about ourselves. In the Netherlands, I mean. Um, that's our place, that's our domain. Uh, and we have to keep in mind that in the Dutch parliament, fascists or neo-fascists have 20% of the seats. That's more than there are neo-Nazis in, in the Ukrainian parliament. Any case, so we have to turn our, uh, to turn our uh, spectrum also to the Netherlands. We have to be clear that there is a fifth column in the Netherlands too, inside the parliament, and we have the journalists to uncover that. So this is a huge task for the nation. No, it's not a huge task. It's just, it's just doing, a professional, doing, task, doing a professional task. task. But the last eight years, we didn't uh, try it our best to enough, let's say it that way. I don't want to blame anyone, but we have the time now to, let's say, to correct ourselves. Okay. And how can we do that? By just doing it? And, you know, for example, to, just to, to cover up the finances of some of the parties in Parliament. Uh, trying to understand uh, if there are other material links between these parties and party leaders and the Kremlin and so on and so on. That's information which is useful for the, for the, the Dutch audience at least and perhaps for more than other Dutch audience. Mm. You live both in Russia and in Ukraine. You still have many friends there. What are they telling you? Well, my Russian friends are, of course are in absolutely disarray mentally. But to understand, I think it's also a, it, the difference between Russia and Ukraine is very important, I think, that Russia doesn't have a civil society. I don't agree with the South. Of course there are independent journalists. Of course there are intellectuals who are trying to, to, uh, to be independent and critical, etc. But Russia, as, as a whole, as a state, lacks a civil society. Contrary, contrary to Ukraine, mm -hmm. which is a society with a civil society, and in that way it is a more European society than the Russian. So I would like to, to let's say a little of advice to you. Um, the prospects for independent journalism in Ukraine are much higher than in Russia. Because there is a civil society in Ukraine. And perhaps it would be nice, not nice, it would be um, racial to support Ukrainian journalism a bit more than Russian journalism at the moment. So in Ukraine there are living 40 million people. In Russia, we live in 140 million people. So let's say for every euro we spend in Russia, we spend three euro in Ukraine and one euro in the Netherlands. <laughs> Maria, thank you very much for being here. Well, as a Russian, I can only support like a big two euro actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm seriously comparing this to Russia. That's a bit uh, so much. <laughs> so Maria, so just uh, come now. Belarusian journalist, media development expert now working at Free Press Limited. So, um, what are your takes on the information war? You heard Hubert's um, answer, but what are your takes? Well, of course, I can agree that there has been a lot talked about information war, but usually it was all in shortcuts. Russia Today, Sputnik, I mean, very often, the very much Russian language or Georgian language, Moldovan language, Belarusian, maybe less language or Ukrainian language propaganda coming out of Kremlin was just dismissed because it was not close enough to the European Union. And the European Union and the United States have been doing efforts to really introduce laws how to cut Russia's state broadcasters to broadcast in English or Spanish, but didn't really care enough to analyze and see how to strengthen these ties between independent reporters who are trying to provide realistic news about what's going in the region to the population of the region, to the population of Moldova, Ukraine, Belarus, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Russia itself. And the result of it, indeed, as we see, is that um, I don't say the Kremlin has won any information war, I believe it's losing now hugely to especially Ukrainian strategic communication. Uh, the Ukrainian strategic communication is so good that sometimes, as Maxim says, it's a bit even you know, too good. Um, <laughs> but it has enough moral grounds to believe that the West would not care about 
the sphere of its influence, or if tomorrow it wants to go back to Transnistria, and day after it wants to invade or reinvade North Ossetia, and my home country, Belarus, is now under the occupation of Russian troops, but we're being labeled by the foreign media as aggressor or accomplice. So, we have good journalists, we have good media, we have been really fighting, and the result of that, Russians going in the streets, Belarusians going in the streets, despite 800 people being arrested for saying no to war just this past Sunday, is the result of work of these brave journalists who very often work together with their Ukrainian colleagues. Since 2020, actually, the situation changed even more because Ukraine became a safe house, as Natalia mentioned, to many Belarusian media professionals who were fleeing the repressions of the regime. It provided them protection, it provided them uh, visa status, it provided them with working place, and for a long time, we were working together with Ukrainians, thinking we're fighting for the common cause. Now, the biggest danger I see in the informational war is that actually, unfortunately, both some of the Ukrainian sources and Russian sources prefer to show all Belarusians as one nation supporting Russian invasion and portray Belarusian civil society and Belarusian independent journalists as accomplices of the invasion because they didn't do enough to, let's say, make Lukashenko go. As much as I would want to see Lukashenko go, I believe it's in Kremlin's interest <coughs> to now put off these neighborly nations against each other and we should not repeat the mistake that we have been doing for eight years, thinking it's just Russia's spheres of interest, let's not really go into that, let's concentrate on dangers in Europe. I think this is where we really need to support this lifeline for anyone who provides credible information about Ukraine in and around Ukraine. Should it be in the vicinities, in the neighboring countries, but the main thing is what transports information about Ukraine. Otherwise, we really risk to lose one more war. That's all. Thank you. But maybe can, can you help us think along what kind of support is needed to set up this media and I can. I can speak from my humble experience. So. Um, since elections 2020, even before that, we started thinking together with many Belarusian media professionals what we can do uh, to support the alienation of people. Because many of these journalists sitting in these mini bunkers in these rooms, even if they're working together, they feel really lonely, sometimes abandoned. So we believe that we believe that the best way would be to create some space for collaboration, even physical space. Yes, it can be inside Ukraine, in the Western Ukraine, it can be in the borders. We've already set up two hubs, for example, Belarusian journalists, and we would be very happy if they could be extended to host, maybe not an exile, but temporary coming to Poland, Ukrainian journalists, to think together, to think collaboratively about what can be done. We are already using our connections. Let's say I'm now running a project for Central Europe on medical journalism, but we're using the connections to get this best you mentioned. Because we just talked to Polish Gazette of the Bocha, who is our partner, could you just store these vests because we have no place to store them in that city? And they agreed like that. That is because of collaboration. So my big advice to the media lifeline, I don't want to speak in the name of Ukrainians, and you had a lot, is to really, you know, enable this collaboration. This is what we are here. Um, I would really like to hear your thoughts and your ideas to make this media lifeline alive. Any ideas, suggestions? Paul Blush, you spoke to me earlier. You had a great idea. Yeah, do I do I need to catch something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Lars Moody, uh, the director of the European Journalism Centre. Uh, no, I just said I'm to you next to you and I said uh, I was approached uh, today twice, but also yesterday. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of um, support out there. 
but I thought it would be good to be here because then we might be able to align because if we all start to do little things then it might miss out on big things. So one of the things that I was approached today was uh, by uh, a Google News initiative in YouTube to see if they can support, uh, if we can vet local journalists and their channels and also choose the right ones uh, and also possibly to uh, support them with money. Um, well, of course, it's tricky, and this is exactly where you need a network because who is able to find uh, the good ones? Uh, I think all of us can. Um, and, uh, and, and together we can for sure. Uh, yeah, and I can think for sure. So, so, uh, so that's why I'm here. So that's one of the uh, the uh, what can we do from our office in Maastricht? Well, we can come to Amsterdam and, and, and sit down with all of you and see if we can make a change. Very good, very good. And this is all also what it's about, right? To coordinate all kind of initiatives, to tie them up together, and to come up with a very strong, strong answer. And just maybe to add, uh, our Belarusian colleagues from Stiglavitz and also this are meeting Google people tomorrow or today in Vilnius, and they're talking weekly about exactly the same, not only how to verify the good and trustworthy channels that Google News would want, but actually, if you Google in Russian any news about Ukraine, you'll get only propaganda channel still suggested to you as the most credible resources. In Belarus, it would be the state news agency, and it would be real novelty and everything in Russian. Now, half of the population of Ukraine understands Russian if not everyone, right, or speaks. And like, imagine you're trying to find anything about what's happening to your neighboring country. This is what Google does, and this is what they're very, very shy to admit. They prefer to throw some money into this small local media to feel that their conscience is clean. But I believe that indeed, if we join the forces in that, and together maybe with some European uh, institutional actors, we could try to get this real results, right? And Maxim and Yusim are also working on that. Yeah, I think that uh, this is a, a situation that it's very sorry to hear, uh, to see, that we've been warning big tech companies for eight years to deplatform uh, at least official disinformation sources on Google or social media platforms. And for eight years, they've been ignoring our calls to introduce more independent press, independent and neutrals to their ecosystems. And not what they're doing now, try to present it as an act of solidarity with Ukraine, in fact, is just covering their tracks and whitewashing their inability or, you know, lack of desire to act in the last 10 years. And this is important also to support this kind of collective bargaining of independent neutrals now, because there is an opening, but there is also a lot of work to do, to organize, to help people, to reach out, to know the right people, and at least for now, for this window opportunity, they're you know ready to listen to us and having meetings with us, thankfully, after eight years. So this uh, a lot can be, I believe, can be done now if we act. Yeah, right. Yeah, to seize the moment, basically, yeah. and, and stay uh, critical also. Thank you. Not, not to come to their defense, because that's not why I'm here, but I would say that it's a good thing that uh, organizations like Free Press Unlimited and also AJC uh, at least are identified now as, as uh, possible partners to, to work on it, which means that we are visible in that space and that uh, many times we need to act as a firewall between the money and, uh, and the good work. Uh, and I think that uh, yeah, that's why we need to look into it as well. But I certainly uh, agree with uh, anything that you have said and all this criticism is noted and it's also something that we always keep in mind. Yeah, but uh, thanks for your, uh, for your good guidance. <coughs> Anybody else? Or <laughs> yeah. um, my name is Laura Stein, I'm from Hau um, and If you're uh, listening, listening to you uh, and, and also following on the news, you have, you have the feeling that uh, the, the journalists in Eastern Europe are far more aware of the dangers of the situation than journalists in the West, like, like in Holland. Um, and I, I would like to ask you if you have any idea of how could, how, how could we um, uh, heighten the awareness of Western journalists to, to the story, uh, uh, to, to enhance the contacts, to, to
to try and, 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 and reach out, because it is true, as Subir said, that mostly the discussion here is about Russia, uh, because it's big, it's interesting, it's powerful, etc. But all the countries in between, or now so, you know, it's not for nothing that, that, that it's Poland that takes all almost all refugees from, from Ukraine uh, with open arms, etc. There is a, a feeling of great solidarity in Central and Eastern Europe that this is about their future and their lives. And I think that in the West, this is still a, a, a far away struggle. So how, how would you suggest to get this message through and to, to get in touch with uh, to, 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 f to form a bridge between Eastern European journalists and, and, and Western ones. Let's see. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I'm really happy to see that there's first, there's a conversation starting in Western newsrooms about decolonizing their coverage of the region, which has been a huge problem, as you mentioned, with outsized focus on Russia, little focus on indigenous voices, in the region in Eastern Europe. Um, we've always kind of had to fight to have a voice, you know, and it's constantly been uh, balanced with, you know, Russia and it has to be in the same package when stories that are happening in the region have the web value on their own. I think uh, one important thing is to expand your awareness of journalism in general in the region. There are fantastic brands with decades of a legacy that do a terrific job, including in English, including, you know, in Russian, uh, that could be amplified globally. You know, within partnerships that we help to manage, we do exactly that within the region, but also globally. But, you know, you can do as much with limited resources of trying to amplify those voices on global uh, uh, scale. And yet we still manage to, you know, to you know, some of our um, um, some of our newsletters, uh, for example, feature independent uh, journalism from the region. A big Western newsrooms subscribe. You know, not all, often they amplify. Sometimes they just look for leads and stories there, and they do stories themselves. But still, it's important uh, work to do, and we've been constantly, Maria, you know. Uh, knows better than anyone. We've been constantly struggling to find resources to do it you know, on a more international level because this is a lot of work, but we know the brands, we know the newsrooms, we know the journalists and journalism that is uh, deserving to be amplified globally in English and other languages. Um, and this is something that unfortunately has been lacking in especially in recent uh, eight years, even for such a massive country as Ukraine. Right. But the key question is how to bridge the how to connect them. Hubert, do you maybe as a former journalist has an idea on this? To connect to the, the Dutch audience. To the Dutch media. To the Dutch media. 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 <coughs> you know, I, I, uh, I don't want to be optimistic. In my former newspaper, NSU so Hansblad, white liberal newspaper, I'm still fighting for renaming Belarus in Belarus. So we have a long way to go. Okay. And not white Russia. Yeah, that I meant to. I meant to part. But can I add one quick thing? Sure. Uh, unlike eight years ago, um, there are fantastic, you know, journalists from the region working now in Western newsrooms. I mean, I know plenty of Ukrainians who work in German, in English, in French, Belarusians. You know, a lot of people, I think that this is also an on reflection for newsrooms, or Western newsrooms, if you cover that region, do you have voices from that region, do you have journalists from that region with unique perspective and unique sensitivity to those topics that can tell those stories? I think it's, you know, at the, at the, at the foundation of it, a question of diversity in the newsrooms, so, you know. The start of the beginning is there? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, maybe I saw also Thomas Bruni in the audience. Thomas, uh, Secretary of the Dutch Association of the Journalists. Maybe you can um, help in this uh, way? Yeah, of course, I, I, heard, I heard the, the discussion. I think there is, a, well, there is at least some, some way of, of, of help we can provide. I mean, we, uh, you 
organize around 8,000 professional journalists here in Holland. And one of the first things, of course, we can do is give the people from Ukraine and from Belarus, uh, the, the journalists from Belarus and Ukraine, who have access to good information, who have access to, uh, to good contact, give them a place in our magazine, in our digital magazine, Fido Media, and, and build a bridge or build a sort of connection because Hubert is right. I mean, it's always difficult, and I mean, we have, have plenty of conversation about that with Free Press Unlimited about all the worries you have about the world and what's going wrong with press freedom in the world and the misconnection <laughs> with the fact that these things don't, don't often come to the, uh, to, uh, to, the Dutch to the Dutch audience, but I think at this time uh, things are a little bit different because we all feel European and I, I don't think I can imagine uh, a war that has brought about so much uh, intensity among the public uh, as this one because we all feel that this is part of, of our hearts and this is part of our uh, interest also to put it more coldly i mean so this i, I think is is a good opportunity and i also think that we uh, we had a uh, uh, quite an intense discussion this week about uh, the thing maria brought up about uh, sputnik and, and russia today and i think uh, we, uh, the suggestion you made is also something we can uh, go to politics to and also go to the, to the big social media companies that not say you have to uh, prohibit the access to, to these kind of uh, channels because this, this is not the way because then you're only uh, copying the, the behavior of, of, of Russia but uh, giving them uh, or asking them to, to, uh, to really put the light on the right sources there and, and then you make uh, and then you make clear that you that we here live in a democracy where we give the people a choice, but we also have to be aware that we have to give them a serious choice. And as long as the, the <coughs> algorithms go to the wrong place, then of course you should realize that you also have to do something it, about the, the technical side behind it. And if I can only just make a comment, maybe I would have agreed with everything you've said eight days ago, nine days ago, but I believe right now, when it comes to Russia to face Putin, or fed by Kremlin local language websites, we need to probably rather take not a First Amendment approach, but the European historical approach to spread Nazi propaganda. If you are ready to also give my cup uh, free access and, uh, you know, Nazi, as Americans do, they have no problem. You can, you know, sell my cup, you can say you're a Nazi, then of course, then Europe has to take this approach. But I think Europe has learned this historical lesson that when it comes to the genocide or genocidal behavior, when it comes to certain red line, then I think we need to really, unfortunately, um, think if it's not a time to consider some of the uh, Kremlin-sponsored resources uh, that they're already in that category. But sorry for interrupting you, but I just wanted to make myself 100% clear. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Maria. Any other suggestions? Yes, I have. Yes, you uh, <laughs> Just thinking about it here, sitting at the table. Perhaps it's nonsense. But in Amsterdam is located the biggest internet hub in Europe. Uh, next to the H1, uh, A1 highway. Let's try to uh, convince the, the CEO of that internet hub to switch off Kaspersky and to give the space out there to rightly reliable Belarus, Ukrainian and Russian <coughs> journalistic sources. That's the way, that's the thing we can, perhaps we can influence here. No theoretic, theoretical discussion, switch off Kaspersky, give the space to journalists from Ukraine, Belarus, independent. Just and check with the journalists, I think some of them are still using Kaspersky for protection. Right. Yeah. And then they have to choose for another one. But you understand what I mean? Yeah. So this is a terrific point because not many understand that uh, Russian state propaganda in Russian state 
heavily relies on the infrastructure and digital infrastructure that is run by big tech. They don't need. Yeah, uh, cloud services, protection after, uh, um, of, uh, from DDoS attacks, and mm -hmm. this is all Western, Western services that they rely heavily to keep fueling genocidal propaganda that they're pushing out there in many languages. And this is something that uh, journalists as well as civil society already working now to fix. But of course, uh, this is uh, something that affects all of us, including journalists. And I think it, there was also a professor of uh, finances, this uh, Russian born in the US, who actually said that more than oil and gas sanction, this exclusion of Russian state services from the big tech support from the West would, would make a greater influence on their economy. So here I actually agree with you 100%, but I would also suggest to really look at whether we can talk to the European institutions about that. We have Common Market, we have Vera Jourova, who is really working for this media freedom approach inside the EU, and it seems like a perfect uh, possibility for us to also to lobby for the European Commission to take greater steps in that. Great. Are there politicians here? Because uh, I thought it were. <laughs> Maybe they can take up this uh, idea. It's very good, but we will also uh, uh, try to strive for that good idea. Anything else? Yes, Verdier. Eens komen Verdier. Yes. Um, uh, I'm Verdier van Nauwhuizen and uh, I'm a co founder of Moore. As some of you might know, it's a national photo agency. I was I co-founded in Nor with Yuri Kozirev, my good Russian friend. And together with Yuri and uh, our other member, Olga Kravitz, who is Russian-Ukrainian, uh, we took the initiative because for the last 13 years we've been teaching uh, master classes, many of them uh, uh, in, the, in the region of uh, Ukraine, Russia. And we contacted 60 of uh, our former participants uh, from Belarus, Ukraine, uh, and Russia, and other neighboring countries to see what their needs are and how we could help them uh, with our network uh, to get uh, visuals out, uh, to stop the misinformation as well, and because they, they have been trained. And, you know, I mean, the, the problem they are facing is, is obviously safety. There's a lack of flag jackets. There's a real problem that some of them are contacted by international media who refuse to give them a proper insurance. So, um, you know, I think we, we do have a network and, and we could really collaborate and see how we could, could help here and, and get the information out. Yeah, good point. Can I uh, add one quick thing? There is, there is already growing, fastly growing infrastructure that Ukrainian civil society put in place and journalists put in place to get that help through the border to or affected uh, country with as least as possible uh, hurdles. And I think this is all so important. I mean, as a journalist always call for, you know, when they call for, for help, they say this thing, please try to uh, make this effort as united as possible so when you send something it's not in a bazillion different parcels but it's one effort that it's easier to get through the border you know get through the customs uh, so this is important to understand to you know everyone who wants to pitch in it has to be an organized effort and it's extremely important otherwise we already have a really some incidents of crucial aid stuck at the border because organizations didn't know who to call, how to organize it, because, I mean, this is country at war and you gotta know the right people and be at the right time with the right kind of aid. Yeah. Uh, Kadir, maybe it's good. To, uh, are you aware of the Emergency Response Fund of uh, Free Press Limited or the GIFs? Maybe it's good to coordinate. Jantien, are you willing to uh, share some information on that? The coordination? Yeah. Okay, cool. Catch from and catch. <laughs> <laughs> Young team from Herwijn, she's running our uh, emergency support and uh, reporters response, but it's also part of the coordination group uh, JIT. Yeah, so it's in this stress. Yeah, so it's with Julius in this test network, and what we do on a daily basis, we coordinate on cases. 
with most international uh, media support organizations. So it's on individual cases, people that have to be relocated, uh, people that need medical support, psychological support, but also on um, media organizations that need to continue working. So we make sure that money is not, you know, that it's like uh, not going to one organization, but that we all know who's supporting who. And then especially now with, uh, uh, with the vests and the helmets that we want to get in, it's really difficult to get them over the border. So we found a company that can bring them to Poland. And then another organization also has a uh, 100 vests ready. So we try to coordinate together together into the country, into Ukraine, to make sure that not you know that it's not stuck there. Right. So, so if there are more questions on this, uh, uh, there is coordination on that, and you can drop your uh, question to uh, your team later on. Um, are there also other suggestions uh, to support this lifeline, the media lifeline? Uh, the, the term insurance uh, drops. Um, I know, is there anyone here from an insurance company? Because that is maybe also very important. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were here. <laughs> is there anything an insurance uh, company can do in this case? I, I think, first of all, it, it's. it's, it's uh, it's not new for me, uh, insurance crisis, because we saw just a few years ago the same situation in Syria. Uh, I think that we almost forgot how, how bad it was over there, and also for the journalists. Uh, I think to, 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 to insure something instantly, it's very difficult to think of ahead. Uh, I think it's possible. If, if you look into the future, it can be done. You need a collective. Uh, I started a collective for the NGOs in the Netherlands, and uh, then it's possible to ensure uh, as well the bad risk as the good risk. Uh, I think that combination is not yet here for journalists. Uh, and I think maybe that's something to, to work on to get the journalists united. Uh, so we, it, it's possible to ensure them in a collective way. Because a single journalist in the crisis area like Ukraine at the moment, it's not insurable. Uh, but when you do it in advance, in a collective way, I think it's possible. Uh, I, I think we have a collective. I mean, yeah. It's, yeah. it's not only our, our unions, but I mean, we provide uh, uh, special war or less uh, insurance yeah. with what we see happening. So, so we have, together with the public, uh, uh, with the, the, the public news companies, but also all, for all individual freelancers here in Holland, there is this special insurance. But what we see happening right now, at this moment, that already the, uh, the insurance of uh, special equipment like uh, cameras, etc., are being uh, well in, in the in the situation of Ukraine. They say, okay, now we uh, we don't insure it anymore. So we are now in discussion with with our insurance company. Yeah. But and, and the same when was for Syria and the same was for yeah. other uh, war situations. But usually. Uh, they, they, they come up with a, with a solution with an insurance company, but till the moment right now, today, we have not found a solution. Uh, I think you, you need to talk to me. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> 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 I'll, I'll, I'm happy to connect uh, the two of you. Maybe not see. Yeah, just a, a quick remark on that. Uh, not many people understand that a lot of newsrooms in Ukraine have registered EU-based entities. And this is uh, sometimes, I mean, if you know who to ask, this is sometimes a way around for a lot of legal, including, as I uh, suggest, suspect, insurance-related uh, problems that we have. Um, not every newsroom has, but some newsrooms have. And, you know, please also reach out uh, to find out, you know, who can help them right. with that. Yeah, that and I, I, I believe that this is, 
by, by discussing the things, it becomes clearer to me why the media life right is needed. Because we just, in this group, have identified a lot of like small pieces of the puzzle, but there is no one info center and coordination for us to actually be like this one window to which a journalist or media outlet can knock from both sides, Netherlands, or maybe later Global Europe, and Ukrainians say, hey, so I need to ensure this stringer in Kharkiv. Can we get your European entity to make a work contract with them? I don't know, something like that. So it's also serving as a glue, bridging the gap, rather than thinking that it's the solution for everything. Right. But from my coordination experience from other countries, this coordination work is also very time and resource heavy because you cannot fail people. You cannot promise them a hotline and then have half a person staffed. Then it would be a failure. So if we're to get serious about it, then the lifeline should have some coordination center, some helpline, and some people responsible for these bridges. Yeah, sounds like a plan. Uh, equipment, anybody? Okay, that is also needed. <laughs> um, any other suggestions? Hubert, you were Refug getting inspired, right? No, refugees, perhaps. I can, I can imagine that you cannot 24 7 work in, in, in the front line uh, area as Ukraine or Belarus, that you need some rest sometimes. Uh, and I think this could, would be quite important. I, I could uh, presume at least. Uh, Quite important to have some places in the Netherlands uh, for rest for foreign journalists from Ukraine and yeah, I mean, well, I'm, not, I'm, not just sure, I'm not sure about the Netherlands because I've just spoken to 35 Belarusian media professionals and what they say they want to be clo well, close I mean, to the, close to okay. home sometimes even within the country then, but it can be also in the Netherlands okay. but what I'm just saying is sometimes it's even cheaper to have it closer to home okay. And then to offer some people who want to come to a country with a new language, new mentality, new culture, a lot of new things for them, which is stressful, and that option. But I totally agree with you. The psychosocial support and the rest and respite programs, psychological support, is definitely something that the Netherlands has been good with. We have been working with the Justice and Peace Shelters in Tbilisi just the last one and a half years, and some other, uh, we have our own initiatives like that. So I'd like to support you on that. Yeah, very good. Yes, Ruth. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ruth. I work at Free Press Unlimited. I, I wanted to uh, remind us that uh, on Monday is a, a large national day of uh, raising funds for uh, emergency funds for Ukraine. And if we think, as we sit here um, or watch the live stream, that information is um, of, uh, of life importance and access to reliable information needs to be supported, why are we not at the table there? Because uh, I think the money that they will be raising uh, there uh, also depends on the images that all of us see. And this is a way to reach out to all the Dutch people and tell them about the importance of uh, access to information as it can save lives locally. Uh, and we need to protect those journalists. There. Yeah, I think we can. We have identified some steps that we need to take. Uh, it's clear that we need to coordinate as much as we can, uh, and we will, because uh, that is uh, one of the strengths uh, of our organization, I would say. Um, we are going to make this happen, one way or the other, because it's necessary, it's needed. And if you want to join us in this pledge, then I invite you to uh, please uh, write down your name and uh, whatever you can contribute, doesn't matter. Uh, everything is very, very, very welcome. Um, you can ask uh, later at the reception, you can uh, come to us, to any of us, to talk about uh, this idea further. We're very happy to, uh, to, to talk to you. I want to say big, huge thanks to the Dutch Postcode Lottery for uh, helping us out, for uh, giving us this space and uh, the, the premises. Uh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. There is a standing reception even, so also thank many thanks to the Dutch Postcode Lottery. 
where we can chat uh, more. Uh, so I, on behalf of the Pascal Glossary, I invite you to that. Thank you so much for coming.